Good evening, everyone. We're so glad that you cho chose to join us tonight for the Wednesday night interactive Bible study. As you can tell tonight, we're going to try something a little bit different. I have Brother Lentz Toth with me tonight. Brother Lentz, how's your week been going? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, not as busy as past weeks I've had, to be honest with you. I understand. How are you adjusting to the new normal? Are you still out? Working, tell us kind of what's going on in your world. Um, not a whole lot has changed. Uh, I'm still working, but I don't have as many hours as I've had in the past. But I do have a little bit more time on my hands, and it's caused me to sort of reprioritize things and put some things in perspective. I totally understand. I'm hearing from many folks that are saying, uh, saying the same thing that they're reprioritizing some things in their life and I think that is I think that is a good thing um, tonight we will continue on with the study of the book of first Corinthians and we will be going to I believe chapter 6 and verse 10 is where we will start tonight if you're following along in your Bible also we have the worksheets and if you have not been receiving these, if you will let someone know at the church, uh, we will make sure that you get those either through email or through the Facebook page. So I want to make you aware of that. It's a uh, tool that you can use to follow along with us and to uh, keep you engaged. Also, we will be having questions again at the end of the session tonight. I have Brother Lentz here tonight, so I'll let him field all the extremely hard questions, and I'll try to take all the easy questions, so it should work out great for us on that. Let's see, let's go to chapter 6, verse 10, and we remember the sins that were listed in chapter 9, uh, chapter 6, verse 9 last week. They were sins of the body and they seem to be classed together. And then the sins listed in chapter 6, verse 10 <clears throat> include stealing, envy, drunkenness, character assassination, and extortion. And these are also bad sins. I don't believe there are any big uh, bad sins, good sins, um, less sins, more sins, bigger sins. Smaller sins. I believe sin is sin. However, some sins carry along the attachment of an emotional attachment and sometimes involve other people so other people get hurt. But I believe that God views sin as sin. And with that in mind, just because these sins occurred outside of the body doesn't make them any less or more important than the sins that were listed last week in verse 9. They're not sex sins, but they're still sins. And greed is a very powerful thing if it's allowed to take root in the heart of a person. And then, depending on what version of the Bible that you are reading, uh, some, some translations use the word reviler. And these are just simply people that kill people with their words. This would be a character assassination or a gossip or a falsehood told on someone with the, with the purpose the end purpose of ruining their reputation or destroying that person in the eyes of somewhere, someone else. Embezzlers, we know that these are people that take financial advantage of people, and unfortunately, most embezzlers would prey on a person that is, that is either unaware or unable to defend themselves against this. And again, these sins to occur outside of, uh, outside of the body they're still just as detrimental. But, Brother Lentz, there is hope. Right. Um, so we look at those sins, and we can say those are pretty rough sins. But if we look at verse 11 of chapter 6, it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord and Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So um, not every Christian has been guilty of these particular sins, but... None of us have a, a clean record. We all, all have some kind of sin in our past. We, are, we were born into sin and shaped into iniquity. But um, when you look at this, it kind of puts things in perspective and lets you know that you were once a sinner. But Paul said 
that uh, some of the Corinthian Christians were falling back in their old patterns of sin, and he needed, he needed to remind them that if they went all the way back to the lives they once lived, they were not going to inherit life in heaven eternally. When uh, the scripture says washed, it's referring to new life through the Spirit, which cleanses us and regenerates us. And sanctified means set apart. Um, if you're sanctified, you're easily recognizable because you, you're not living like everybody else. You're set apart. You have a different lifestyle. So this is the result that a transformed life always brings about. Justified, the term justified refers, refers to a new standing before God through his righteousness. By his death, our sins have been remitted by his blood. And by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings about the transformation. When God fills you with his Spirit, you will always be transformed. So everyone who has ever lived has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We are washed in his blood and set aside for the work that he has for us to complete. And we receive his spirit. We are new creatures in Christ. And we receive his spirit. We are completely transformed. When we receive that spirit. We, our behavior changes. Our lifestyle changes. When we receive the spirit of God, it brings about a complete transformation. And to tag on with the transformation, this past Sunday, of course, was Easter Sunday. And the reason we as Christians celebrate that day is because we have been born again. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. We have been born again. We have been literally born into the family of Christ. And this gives us the power to overcome sin. This gives us the power to live above sin. None of us are perfect, and, and becoming a Christian doesn't make us perfect. However, it does give us the ability to live above sin and to live a life that is pleasing to God. In verse 12, the word expedient means suitable for achieving a particular end in a given circumstance. And the definition of power can mean influence or the ability of a person to control the environment around them. So in this scripture, Paul was, was saying that he refused to be influenced by, uh, uh, by others who were around him or to be influenced by Satan. And that is an important thing to realize uh, the Word teaches us that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. I believe that Christians should not uh, practice segregation. We, we're part of the world. We should be part of our communities. We should, we should, on our public jobs, we should interact with people freely. This does not mean that we compromise what we believe at all, but it simply means that we can have relationships outside of the church. We can reach people outside of the church without compromising our Christian beliefs. God has not called us to be reclusive. He's called us to be part of society and part of our, our cities and towns and our communities and neighborhoods. We should be the best employees at work. We should be the best neighbors uh, in our neighborhoods because we have been filled with the Spirit. We're Christians. That doesn't give us an excuse just to kind of roll into our bunkers and wait for God to come back. It gives us every right to be out being an example for other people. Uh, if you look at verse 12, this can be probably one of the mo more controversial scriptures in the Bible. First, we must remember who Paul was writing to. The Corinthians were still very much caught up in re regulations of their Jewish upbringing. They were still adhering to the law or trying to adhere to the law. And Paul was letting them know that they were not obligated to keep the letter of the law because Jesus fulfilled the law for us. The Old Testament thought that obedience is better than sacrifice. And obedience is an act of our own free will. We obey because we know that it will please God. Sacrifice for the Jews had become an obligation, not a choice. And Paul was letting the Corinthians know that he was not obligated to do anything or not to do it. We should be willing to choose to please God as an act of our free will, not because we are being forced to do something or being forced to live a certain way. Uh, the new Christians, they were still sacrificing and they were keeping the old Mosaic law because they felt obligated to do that. And Paul was letting them know he was not, not under the obligation of the law, but he was a free agent to act in a way that was pleasing to God. Paul was not saying 
that he had a license to sin without receiving punishment for those sins. He was simply saying that he chose for himself the lifestyle that he wanted to live. With the benefit of his conscience, he did the things that were right and the things that were good for him under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He refused to be a servant to sin, and I think that's important for us to realize tonight. We do have a choice. All of us have a choice, and we can either choose to live for God or choose not to live for God. We can choose to be a part of a church or not be a part of a church. We all live by the choices that we make, but it was Christ within him that helped him make the right decisions. And Paul was simply letting the people know there is no law against that. Brother Lentz, uh, verse number 13. Verse number 13 says, Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So Paul was letting the Corinthians know that there was no justification for sexual immorality. In the spirit, all believers make up the body of Christ. Our body is the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Um, we, it's, it's important that we make sure that our bodies, our temples are clean and we have room in our temple for God to come in and dwell because God will never dwell in an unclean temple. So our bellies, along with any other parts of our bodies, should not be our God because these things are temporal and will one day pass away. The real us will one day live in the new body God will provide for us when the rapture of the church takes place. And Paul went on to explain that we know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, his body was buried, and on the third day he rose again. So mortal must put on immortality. Because Jesus rose from the grave, our bodies will be changed, raised, and glorified, and made heavenly. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are all individuals making up the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the body. Um, this is important to understand that we need each other. One uh, part of the body can't function without the other. It's important that we have unity in the body of Christ. In verse 16, Paul references Genesis 2 and 24 that speaks of the union of man and woman in a marriage relationship becoming one flesh. All Christians, whether male or female, are one in spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. Husband and wife relations on this earth are in the flesh, but they are not one in spirit. In heaven, it will not be this way. There is no marrying or taking in marriage in heaven. So Paul affirms that all sexual relationship outside of marriage is sin, but illicit relations by believers are especially bad because they profane Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 19 lets us know that the body of a Christian belongs to the Lord. And like Brother Lentz just talked about, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's consider this. Every act of sin committed by a believer is committed in the Holy of Holies where God dwells. In the Old Testament, the high priest only went into the Holy of Holies once each year and only after extensive cleansing and going through extensive rituals, lest he be killed for going into the Holy of Holies without a clear conscience or without a clear direction and to make sure that he had been ritually cleansed. And I think that that really drills home a point today that if we really do consider that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, I, I guess the question that could be asked is, am I a clean temple? Am I being the best temple that I can be? Do I want to take a chance on defiling that holy place or the holy of holies where the Spirit of God dwells? So when Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins on the cross, He bought us and He paid us, but paid for us in full. A word that is often used in this process is the word redemption. He actually redeemed us. We had a price on us. Sin had stolen us away from God. It had severed the relationship that we had with Him, and we literally had to be bought back, or we had to be redeemed. And Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross and He shed His blood for us, the debt was satisfied, and we became reconciled with Him. Reconciled 
just simply means that there is no balance left. In an accountant's life, the word reconcile is very, very poignant, very clear, and very near to the heart of an accountant because once the books are reconciled, that means that it balances. There is no penny, no dollar, no thousands of dollars missing. Both columns absolutely balance. And so he has reconciled us. He has paid our debt. He has brought us back into fellowship with him. It is no longer I who live. Paul said this, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a beautiful expression the way Paul expressed the relationship that he had with Jesus Christ. Paul was saying, I am now dead to the flesh. I'm dead to the carnal nature. I'm dead to the things that my carnal nature would want to do. And I have surrendered my life to Christ. I have given it to him. So I have been raised there again, speaking of the rebirth or the new birth experience of salvation. He has been raised a new creature or a new man. If Christ is in me, then I should treat my body as if it is his temple and should be careful of the things that I, the places that I go, the things that I do, and the lifestyle that I live. In chapter 7, in getting into chapter 7, if you look at the first seven verses of this chapter, this elevates singleness as long as it is celibate. But they in no way teach that marriage is either right or wrong. So the first seven verses, Paul deals with singleness or single people. Paul gave instructions that if someone desired to be married, then they should get married. There is no sin in getting married. There is a sin when people live together who are not married. When two people get married, it's no longer mine and yours, but it's ours. Marriage is a joining of two people who are sometimes very opposite. Obviously, the physical part of a person is very opposite when you marry or join together a male and a female. Emotionally, males and females are different. Uh, the makeup of men and women are different. Yet God chose to put two different people together to form a union that led to the to the foundation of a family when the children come along. So when we get married, we become one flesh. We become close to each other, and we grow in love together. As a single person, Paul recognized the special freedom and independence that he had to serve Christ, but he did not expect all believers to be single. I believe that married couples should strive to serve God together. A ministry will always be so much stronger with both spouses committed to the minister. I caution young ministers who I come into contact with, make sure that your wife is on board with your ministry. If not, your ministry will not be as successful as it could be. I believe that ministry, even though I have a platform ministry, I'm the pastor of a church, my wife supports my ministry, and she is just as much a part of my ministry as I am when I'm ministering behind the pulpit on Sundays or teaching a Bible lesson on Wednesday night. We are a couple. Everything that I accomplish, she accomplishes. And everything that she accomplishes, I share in that accomplishment. So we are a team, and what a beautiful concept in the church today. When God put married couples together, and then he put married couples into the church, and now we really see the illustration of what the body of Christ really is. The union of a husband and wife was meant to be permanent, and a person should not get a divorce on a whim. Divorce is a serious problem in our world today, and it should never be considered except in the most extreme uh, cases. Brother Lentz, if you'll cover verses 14 through 17. Okay, 14 through 17, it says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined 
to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one with one spirit with him. So while it is very important that uh, we find the right spouse, we find a spouse that has the same viewpoints as we do as far as living for God, uh, there are cases where that's not the case. And that doesn't make the marriage any less serious. It's still very serious even if one member is unsaved. But if a marriage consists of a member being unsaved, every effort should be taken to maintain that marriage. And also, every effort should be made to win the unsaved spouse to God through living a, a consistent Christian life. I believe that it's important that you are a, a good example to not only your unsaved spouse, but friends that you uh, maybe work with or come in contact with that don't know God, that don't have a relationship with Him. Because if we're not being good examples, if we're not living up to uh, the title that we claim to be Christian, then we're probably not going to be very successful in winning them to God. Um, if an unbelieving spouse cannot tolerate the partner's faith and wants a divorce, it's probably best to allow that to happen in order pr to preserve peace in the family. Um, like I said before, if a person lives a good Christian life around anybody, especially their spouse, it would have great influence on the non-believer. And if we love them with the same love that God has for us and live peaceably around them, they will probably be won to the Lord by the devotion of one living a Christian life around them. So we need to be good examples. We need to not only proclaim to be Christians, but we need to, be, we need to live a lifestyle that proves that we are Christians. So Paul wraps up chapter 7 with the thought of contentment. We should be content with our life. We should be content with the talents and the abilities that God has given to us. We don't need to try to be in a position where we're wishing we had the talents that somebody else has. We don't need to be in a position where we're env envying somebody else's walk with God because they seem to have it made and we still have work to do. God gave us the talents that he wanted us to have, and we need to be content with those talents. We need to be content with those abilities, and we need to stay in the will of God that he has for us. We should be, we should be content with our ministries and our callings, and we should be content with the spouse that God put in our life. We need to realize that ministry is a partnership, and God calls and equips us for that calling. To just drill down as we... Uh, start to wrap up tonight, Paul's lesson or Paul's admonition about being content, I think is so important in our world today. We live in a world where it seems like everybody wants to be something other than who they are. And I think this is such a mistake because we realize that, that God is uh, omniscient. He is all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He is he is omnipotent. He has all power. And if God created us, and I believe that happened, and if God created us and knew us before we were even conceived, then how naive is it for us to try to change something that a perfect God put together? And Paul talked about in several places in his epistles the thought of being content, the thought of being content with his material possessions, the thought of being content with his relationships, the thought of being content, even with his past life. If you look at the life of Paul, he persecuted, he tortured the Christians. And in spite of that, then Paul is turned around and transformed by the Holy Spirit and becomes the Apostle Paul, and he's preaching to the very people that he was torturing and trying to kill. But Paul was still content knowing that some people would still hate him, some people would still not trust him, uh, some people would hold his past against him, yet Paul did not let that stand between him and being an effective minister in the calling that God had called him to. I think it is so important for us today in, in 2020 to be content with the things that God has given us, to be content with, with our careers, to be content 
with where we live, to be content with our relationship with God. If you are living to God to the, to the best of your ability, if you're exercising and using your talents to the best of your ability and you're, you're working hard in the kingdom of God and you're doing everything that you know to do, then we need a spirit of contentment that lets us know it's all right to be me. It's all right to be you. you we should be comfortable in our, I know the world uses an expression, comfortable in your own skin. We need to be comfortable with who God made us to be, with who God called us to be. And if we are content, then we will be secure. And secure people accomplish so much stuff because they're not trying to outdo someone else or they're not insecure with what they're doing or their talents or, or abilities. And I think that Paul was making a great case here as Brother Lentz so wonderfully expressed. Be content with who you are. Be content in your relationships. Be content in your abilities and the things that God has called you to do. For the next couple of minutes, if you have a prayer request or if you have a question, you can submit those now, and we can address those. We will try, uh, we will try to answer those. We will try to address those. If you have any questions, uh, perhaps we might have missed something that maybe is not very clear. We will try to clear that up. I want to make and continue these Bible studies to be interactive, to make us uh, to make us aware of the study of the, of the Word of God, to, to make sure that every question or any concerns are answered. We can certainly do that. would encourage you to do that. If you have questions on the, on the worksheets, we can handle that. And by all means, if you have any prayer needs, we would love to pray for those and to, to help you. I realize these are stressful times. I realize these are times when people, people need the, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and I believe that that can happen. While we're waiting there for just a couple of minutes, I wanted to again remind you of Sunday service. We will be live streaming beginning at 12 o'clock. Uh, live stream, be sure to join in. Be sure to enjoy, uh, invite someone. Be sure to spread the word. Share the link. Feel free to share that with anybody. We'll be happy for that. I know that last Sunday, there was a little bit of confusion on our Spanish interpretation. We have gotten all the kinks ironed out. And I'm very proud to say that this Sunday, our Spanish-speaking family can tune in, and we will have Brother Omar will be live translating through a conference call. So our Spanish-speaking friends, family can call in to the conference call. And it will be just like being here at Abundant Life Church. I will be speaking, preaching in English. Brother Omar will be translating in Spanish. And that way, all of our Spanish family will not miss every, anything. I would encourage you, if you know someone that speaks Spanish as their first language, by all means, invite them. Let them know that we will have live interpretation going right along with the sermon on Sunday. I'm looking forward to that, and it's so exciting to see what our technology team here at Abundant Life Church has put together in trying to serve all of our church family, not just a certain segment, but all of our church family. And I'm excited about that and excited about what God continues to do. If there are no more, or if there are no questions or any prayer needs, then we will uh, leave you with this. Next week, we will continue on with our study, 1 Corinthians. We will be beginning in chapter 8 next weekend, look, uh, next Wednesday. Looking forward to that for our interactive Bible study. I would encourage you, print the worksheets. Again, invite someone. It would be a great opportunity to invite someone to watch with you and then maybe have some discussion points afterwards or answer any questions uh, after the lesson is concluded. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing everybody via Facebook Live on Sunday. If we can help you or assist you in any way, please don't hesitate to let us know. Call us, text us, email us. We will get back to you, and we will try in any way to help you. God bless you, and thank you for being with us.